I'd like to offer a prayer written by humanitarian educator and civil rights activist Mary McLeod Bethune. Bethune was born to formerly enslaved parents in 1875 and died in 1955. Among her many accomplishments, she was the co-founder of the United Negro College Fund. If you are inclined, let us pray. Father, we call thee Father because we love thee. We are glad to be called thy children and to dedicate our lives to the service that extends through willing hearts and hands to the betterment of all mankind. We send a cry of thanksgiving for people of all races, creeds, classes, and colors the world over, and pray that through the instrumentality of our lives, the spirit of peace, joy, fellowship, and brotherhood shall circle the world. We know that this world is filled with discordant notes, but help us, Father, to so unite our efforts that we may all join in one harmonious symphony for peace and brotherhood, justice, and equality of opportunity for all. The tasks performed today with forgiveness for all our errors, we dedicate, dear Lord, to thee. Grant us strength and courage and faith and humility sufficient for the tasks assigned to us. Amen. My name is Richard Lodge. I'm a member of the Friends of William Lloyd Garrison, the sponsors of tonight's fourth <coughs> annual <coughs> lecture by Dr. Carrie Greenwich, which is entitled, Go Forth and Enlighten Your Brethren, Black New England, William Lloyd Garrison, and the Legacy of Radical Abolition. First, some housekeeping notes. There are exits behind you on Federal Street and behind me to the right on School Street. Please silence your cell phone. There are baskets in the church for donations for next year's lecture, and also baskets for donations to support this great church. <coughs> and we hope everybody can join us afterwards in the fellowship hall behind the sanctuary to meet Dr. Greenwich, who will be signing copies of her books, and as well as we could meet tonight's musician, Lynn Taylor, who will have CDs available. William Lloyd Garrison was born in 1805 in the house of 3-5 School Street, right behind the church. This annual commemoration is to raise awareness about this crusading newspaper editor's contributions to the abolition movement in the 19th century. We're pre pleased that the commemoration this year expanded to include Tuesday's dedication in Brown Square of a, an informational plaque by the New Report Black History Initiative that honors the city's black abolitionists. And on Wednesday night, there was a lecture by Jody Viner, one of the three members behind that initiative, highlighting the work of little known black abolitionists in New Report who helped inspire and radicalize Garrison. The Friends of William and Garrison is an informal volunteer group that relies on support from many people and organizations to continue this annual lecture. <coughs> This year, we're grateful for financial support from the Mass Humanities Expand Massachusetts Stories Grant Program, the New Report Trust Fund Commission, New Report Bank, New Report Preservation Trust, and in-kind support from the Old South Presbyterian Church, New England Sketchbook, a revolutionary press in New Haven, Vermont, the New Report Library, and Jabberwocky Books. We also appreciate a proclamation by Mayor Sean Reardon and the City Council and a citation we received from the Massachusetts House and Rep. Don Sham, which are both out of the, uh, when you came in the front entrance. I also want to acknowledge tonight uh, Frank Garrison and Edith Griffith, who are direct descendants of William Lloyd Garrison. If they're in the audience tonight, uh, Frank came all the way from Gloucester and Edith came from Groton, Massachusetts for the lecture. Our speaker tonight is Dr. Carrie Greenwich, the author of The Grim Keys, The Legacy of Slavery in an American Family, and the book, Black Radical, The Life and Times of William Monroe Trotter. Dr. Greenwich is a Mellon Associate Professor in the Department of Studies in Race, Colonialism, and Diaspora at Tufts University, where she also co-directs the African American Trail Project. Besides publishing two books, Dr. Greenwich's work has appeared in the Mass Historical Review, 
Radical History Reader, The New York of the Atlantic, and The Guardian. Now I'm pleased to introduce our speaker, Dr. Kerry Green. begin, I need to thank um, some people, definitely the friends of uh, Garrison Society. Thank you for having me, and um, Kavir Baumgartner for organizing it, wonderful historian who you have in your midst, and you're happy to live amongst. Um, and of course, Lynn Taylor for providing the music, wonderful, very beautiful at the beginning. Um, <clears throat> I, um, when I'm preparing for this talk, I was wondering how I would address the complexities that some of us have touched on uh, prior to my coming up onto the dais. Particularly the idea that we have in Newburyport and in Garrison, a monumental figure in terms of human rights and civil rights and activism in the abolition movement. At the same time that that can exist aside, the black community that informed and uh, shaped and radicalized his view on the possibilities of anti-slavery. I was also very much um, um, pulled by the idea that of my own connections to Newburyport. Get it go. The switch. No. Technician is coming. <laughs> my own connections to Newburyport. Well, well, you just said um, my grandmother was born in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, in 1916. Her father, my grandfather, great grandfather, was a graduate of um, uh, Dartmouth College and raised his eight children. My grandmother was uh, one of eight in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, and um, had contacts with and relationships with and um, collaborations with Newport and Essex counties, rich African American history. So as a child growing up in um, greater Boston in the 70s and 80s, I was raised to really see this space as a black space, <laughs> as a space where African American people and people of African descent um, had worked um, to eradicate slavery, but also, in my grandmother's time, had worked to found branches of the NAACP, had worked in uh, efforts of something called the African Blood Brotherhood, which we can talk about in the Q&A, and had worked for fair housing in the era. Um, as I was thinking about my talk then, as I was thinking about my talk, there we go. I was reflecting on the fact that all of that history, all of my exposure to that history in this place of Newburyport um, has shaped the way that I approach looking at this complex history as a historian. The image that you see here is of my grandmother um, uh, with her siblings at Mosley State Park. Um, this is a picture of them attending a commemoration to Garrison in the 1930s. And one of the things that my grandmother pointed out was that um, people of African descent, black people in the region when she was a child in the 19 teens and 1920s, were the people that kept Garrison's memory alive by having um, uh, celebrations at Mosley State Park and in people's private homes. I also recall, as I was kind of figuring out how to do this speech, my own past as a, as a child in the 80s coming to visit my great aunt who lived on Purchase Street this is an image of myself and I put my crazy glasses on <laughs> in the 80s. Um, with, uh, on Purchase Street at my great aunt's house. Um, she uh, lived in Newburyport from roughly the 1940s up until her death in 1987. And so as I, was, as I was reflecting on these things, I was wondering how it is that I could use this talk to point out the beauty of the complexities of history. The fact that, that we should embrace the complexities and not shy away from them, and that we should, we should lean into the fact that uh, this is part of the history of enslavement and indeed the history of uh, African American people and all people in the United States. So I'm gonna begin with a short story. Um, I like stories, it's how I came to history to begin with. So on August 21st, 1902, William Monroe Trotter led a group of black lawyers, ministers, and community leaders, including a family from Newburyport, to the Massachusetts State House. The family's last name was Gardner. The group was there to protest the recent arrest 
an upcoming extradition of a North Carolina field hand named Monroe Rogers. Trotter and his group wanted Governor Winthrop Murray Crane to prevent Rogers' return to North Carolina for arson. One year earlier in 1901, two black boys, ages 14 and 17, were brutally lynched in Greensboro while sitting in jail on vagrancy charges. It was no wonder then that Rogers fled his home outside of Charlotte for his mother's house in Massachusetts after confronting the landlord over unpaid wages. The white man's barn was seriously burned down days after the confrontation, and there was no guarantee that the 22-year-old black man would receive a fair hearing. Rogers fled to Brockton, where he sought refuge with family and kin. He said in his letters to uh, black people in Boston that he had heard, quote, of the name of Garrison and recognized that it was a safe haven. He was arrested in Brockton one, Brockton one year later after his arrival, uh, after his arrival from um, North Carolina by a safety commissioner who alerted Massachusetts of Rogers' whereabouts. Trotter mobilized grassroots protests that prompted the meeting with Governor Crane. The group argued that failure by North Carolina to enforce the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, as evidence in the state's unwillingness to investigate or prosecute the recent lynching of the teenage black boys, that this prevented Rogers from receiving a fair trial. Let Massachusetts remember her history, the old days of Garrison, of Walker, and of Phillips, said the Guardian, and protect those who seek refuge from Southern barbarism. End quote. Despite this plea, the notion that militant black abolition could be repurposed to serve 20th century demands for radical civil rights was anathema to the politics of the time. Indeed, public black radical protest was so distasteful in 1902 that the Boston Globe accused Trotter of, quote, stretching things when he connected Massachusetts' responsibility to Rogers to the state's antebellum personal liberty laws an effort pursued and supported by William Lloyd Garrison. The Attorney General was also dismissive of comparisons to the black radical past. He ruled that Massachusetts had no legal basis for detaining Rogers, and in his ruling he actually cited Garrison as, quote, a radical from our past who is best left to the dustbin of history. Booker T. Washington, president of Alabama's Tuskegee Institute and the most powerful black man in the country, confirmed white insistence that Rogers should return to North Carolina for quote-unquote judgment. The school principal personally contacted North Carolina's governor who advised him against quote, giving in, end quote, to the quote, unreasonable demands of colored Boston's tiny but local minorities who are beholden to a past that they don't entirely understand. In response, Rogers' attorneys, much like the radicals of old, filed a writ of habeas corpus, arguing that North Carolina improperly indicted Rogers after he fled the state. Unfortunately for Monroe Rogers, conservative racial accommodation triumphed over radical black demands for his protection. On August 30th, 1902, as the Attorney General reviewed the writ, Brockton police officers who were supposed to transport Rogers from Boston instead put him on a train back to North Carolina. There, he stood trial for arson and attempted murder despite lacking an attorney, and even though the white man whose barn he supposedly burned failed to testify. Rogers was ordered to solitary confinement in the state penitentiary for a minimum of 15 years, but died of septic pneumonia four years later in 1906. William Monroe Trotter, the architect of this protest, was born in 1872, five years after the end of the, uh, uh, eight years, excuse me, seven years after the end of the Civil War, and four years before the death of his childhood idol, William Lloyd Garrison. And yet, from the moment he started The Guardian in 1901 until his tragic death in 1934, Trotter kept a bust of Garrison on his desk in his office on Boston's newspaper row. He believed that he would walk in the footsteps of Garrison. I believe that I pushed the old man, he said, to become more radical on behalf of the colored people, end quote. Part of Trotter's connection to the Liberator editor was personal. <coughs> his father, the Civil War Lieutenant James Monroe Trotter, knew Gar Garrison and his family. Born and enslaved in Mississippi, but educated at a school run by Garrisonian abolitionists in Cincinnati, Lieutenant Trotter served in the 55th Massachusetts Regiment under George Garrison, William Lloyd Garrison's son. Even more than his personal connection to Garrison, however, was Trotter Jr.'s uh, insistence that radical abolition was a black-led movement. 
that it could be recontextualized during the long year of Jim Crow lynching and disfranchisement at the turn of the 20th century to further Garrison's uh, commitment to racial equality, even, Trotter said, if the old man himself might have fallen short in his daily life. This recontextualization was evident in the Monroe Rogers protest, which galvanized grassroots black community activism in the face of federal neglect and northern white apathy. It was also evident in Trotter's founding of the Boston-based National Equal Rights League in 1903, and in his support alongside W.E.B. Du Bois and others uh, for the Niagara movement in 1905. Du Bois frequently uh, vacationed here in Newburyport and associated with his family, the Gardners, um, who lived uh, on Port Purchase Street and on Water Street. As, quote, John was after the Niagara movement, end quote, Trotter acknowledged, quote, with deep thankfulness, the help of our fellow men, like the abolitionists of old. Even as he insisted that, quote, unquote, only the colored people themselves can strike the blow, end quote. And yet, as Trotter emphasized across every issue of The Guardian between 1901 and 1934, radical abolition may have been memorialized by early 20th century white New Englanders as a movement of benevolent white men like Garrison, who were supposedly drawn to anti-slavery by their own innate sense of Christian right. But this was a mistake, Trotter insisted. It does not mean we throw the baby out with the bathwater, he said. We must continue to respect and learn from Garrison, even as we question him. Radical abolition and the militant agitation for civil rights that it produced was born in shape, its parameters set and instigated by black people themselves, as Trotter acknowledged, and as Garrison said and stated frequently in his private papers. Radical demands for black liberation and human justice emerged from black communities whose agitation challenged white reformers like Garrison and his, his contemporaries. Take, for instance, David Walker, whose 1829 appeal demanded justice for quote unquote colored people, in addition to slavery's immediate and uncompensated end, while Garrison still flirted with Benjamin Lundy's more moderate genius of universal emancipation. Born in North Carolina and active in Boston's black community during the 1820s, Walker spoke directly to quote men of color who were also upset challenging them to, quote, go forth and enlighten their brethren to the violent hypocrisy of an American republic built on slave trading and oppression. It was Walker and his black radical allies on the north slope of Boston's Beacon Hill who founded the first radical anti-slavery organization in the country. If you see the advertisement for it here. The Massachusetts General Colored Association, unlike Garrison's New England Anti-Slavery Society in 1833, was entirely led by black men who linked emancipation and slave rebellion to a radical reimagining of blackness beyond the emerging field of racial science itself by Thomas Jefferson and other Republican thinkers. Unlike the New England Anti-Slavery Society, which the MGCA eventually joined, Walker and his fellow black radicals, including MGCA president and Gloucester David, native Th Thomas Dalton, insisted that slave rebellion and militant black political consciousness were as important to the cause of anti-slavery as anti-colonization and general social reform. While most black anti-slavery reformers balked at Walker's appeal, dismissing it as incendiary and accusing it of being written by a white man, Garrison was sympathetic to the sentiment. As a pacifist, he believed that no aspect of the American political system could be used to effect immediate emancipation. Garrison insisted that he sought, quote, submission and peace as a liberator, not rebellion. Still, even he concluded that it was, quote, not for the American people, particularly the whites as a nation, to denounce it as bloody or monstrous. Mr. Walker but pays them in their own coin, but follows their own creed, but adopts their own curse. We avow, he concluded, that if any people were ever justified in throwing off the yoke of their tyrants, the slaves are that people. As an anti-slavery newspaper editor and as founder of the New England Anti-Slavery Society, Garrison's sympathy for black radicalism, despite his own commitment to apolitical nonviolence and general social reform, meant that his anti-slavery was constantly shaped by Boston's black community, who formed the base of his support, and as he stated, were his most reliable subscribers. It's estimated that 70% of readers and subscribers to the, to the um, uh, Liberator were African American people. It is not an overstatement, then, to take seriously the words of William Monroe Trotter nearly 70 years after the Liberator's first issue, in which the Guardian editor insisted that, quote, without the colored people of the city of Boston, indeed, without the colored people of the world, the whites could not fathom justice. 
we, in holding a mirror up to nature, Trotter concluded, alluding to Shakespeare, we, in holding a mirror up to nature, are the conscience of democracy, the impetus for the country's creed, end quote. I argue that the story, leaning into the complexities of garrison, of slavery, of anti-slavery, of abolition, I argue that black people are the architects of radical abolition, and I argue that to make this argument is to complicate self-satisfied claims that somehow people came to anti-slavery naturally, that somehow people as citizens of a predominantly white city like New Orleans came to embrace anti-slavery of their own accord. Indeed, I would argue that um, to argue that black people are at the center of abolition and radical politics is to argue as well for a reconceptualization of how we talk about heroes of the past, not as a way to denigrate them, but as a way to fully account for the central role that black people and communities have played in America's reckoning with its racial past. It is this reckoning that I, that I argue that will ultimately deliver us as a country from the racial abyss. By way of example, I will conclude with a story and then open it up for questions. In the summer of 1902, lots of great four connections in this talk, Angelina Wells Grimke took a trip to Plum Island to visit a black family, again, that name, last name Gardner, who had just moved from Washington, D.C. to Newburyport. At the time, the memory of William Lloyd Garrison was not yet publicly claimed by the town, and his birthplace was recognized as such by the black people in the region, including the gardeners, but ignored by many white citizens of the city. The gardeners therefore took Angelina to see the home place, the birthplace, they said, of William Lloyd Garrison, um, and uh, said that it was a must-see spot on their way to the seashore. Like Trotter, Angelina Grimke's ties to radical abolition and to the movement in the antebellum era were personal as well as ideological. Her great aunts, Sarah and Angelina Bimke, were slaveholders who fled to Philadelphia in the 1820s and converted to Garrisonian abolition. In fact, as a little girl in the Hyde Park neighborhood of, uh, in, the, in Hyde Park, Massachusetts, Angelina Wells Bimke, who you see here, spent uh, most of her time with her uncle Theodore Well, who was a, a radical abolitionist in the vein of Garrison and who credited his own activism to Garrison and the Liberator. Yet in 1902, Angelina Grimke was unimpressed by Garrison's home site and by her friend's attempts to, uh, to memorialize the Garrisons and the moment. We tell stories of the past as a form of congratulation, she moaned to a friend in a letter as she described the incident. What we need is to embrace the inhumanity of it, to reckon with all of its ugliness. I argue that the Grimkeys, the Trotters, and indeed most of the stories that we tell about black families and about families in general, ask us to lean into these complexities, not to hide from them. To admit that we, it is possible to have someone like an Angelina Wells Grimke, who was raised in privilege in Boston and in Washington, D.C., who was the African-American grandniece of the abolitionist um, white uh, Grimke sisters. It is possible to embrace her, but also to acknowledge the pain and the injustice from which she came. With her Grimke family pedigree, for instance, Angelina Wells Grimke called Nana was also on her way to greatness in 1902 when she came uh, to New Bray Park. Uh, she came from a, a well-known family. She was a graduate of Boston Normal School of Gymnastics, which later became Wellesley College, and as a published writer, her poetry frequently appeared in the College American, the Boston Pilot, and the Scribners. She taught English at DC's prestigious Dunbar High School and studied casually at Harvard University in the summer and spent vacations and holidays gallivanting around the Jersey Shore and Anacostia, Maryland, with an equally well-heeled friend, who were also, in some cases, the descendants of the slave of slaves and descendants of the slave sla enslavers. Roscoe Conklin Bruce, for instance, was the son of a Reconstruction era black senator. Ming Burrill was head of the women's department at Howard University. Her grandfather was a white slaveholder um, in uh, Maryland. And made of a war fuller, white was the first institutionally trained black psychiatrist and future sculptors of the Harlem Renaissance. But all of these black people recognized that there was complexity in the very fact that they existed, as it was in the very fact that they were political beings at a time when that was frowned upon. 
For instance, like many African Americans at the turn of the last century, particularly the so-called colored elite in cities like DC, Philadelphia, and Boston, Nana Grimke was cognizant of the fact that she was the granddaughter of both the enslaved and the enslaver. And she leaned into that fact, acknowledging that this was what, as she said, made us keen to analyze the American situation, end quote. She was the grandniece, for instance, of two of Antebellum America's most famous white women performers. Sarah Grimke and Angelina Grimke Well were two of 13 children born to one of the wealthiest and most politically influential slaveholding families in South Carolina. During the 1830s, the sisters earned acclaim amongst New England's anti-slavery leaders for daring to speak publicly against, quote, the peculiar institution in which they've been raised. In fact, Sarah's 1838 treatise became canonical text in the anti-slavery and women's rights movements. In 1838, after nearly a year of touring the North, including staying for uh, multiple nights in Newburyport, um, the uh, Grimke sisters, Angelina Grimke, became the first American-born woman to speak before a state government when she addressed the Massachusetts state legisl legislature on the need for immediate emancipation and women's right to political representation. After Angelina married the radical anti-slavery activist and garrison confidant Theodore Well, her sisters moved to rural New Jersey, where they raised Angelina's children, where they ran a series of reform-oriented and integrated schools for children of the abolitionist movement, including Garrison's children, and continued to host women's rights activists like Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Known as the first founders of women's rights, according to their 1970s biographer, the feminist Gary Lerner, the Grimke sisters were lauded by their contemporaries for supposedly, quote unquote, disavowing their birthright and sacrificing their wealth to support, quote, quote the cause of the slave. These are the facts that we know and that have been passed down to us, and yet both Trotter and Angelina Love Grimke ask us to lean into the complexities of the story. We need to lean into the fact, for instance, that the Grimke sisters were the aunts to the accomplished black Grimke brothers, Archie and Frank. They led black America at the turn of the last century. Archie's daughter, Angelina Well Grimke, um, and less the selfless and uncompromising women's rights activists, Sarah and Angelina Grimke, whose lives have inspired one novel, numerous historical monographs, and seats of honor in national and local women's rights museums across the country. And yet, as Nana Grimke pointed out in 1902, our need to valorize our heroes, our need to uh, uncomplicate the times in which they live, threatens to disallow us from actually enjoying and understanding the complicated times in which we live. How was it, for instance, that Angelina and Sarah Grimke professed horror and feelings of deception when they quote unquote discovered their black nephews while reading an article in the National Anti-Slavery Standard in 1868? William Monroe Trotter would later claim that they, could, they had to have known that their nephews were alive. How could you be a woman of the South and not know the inkling of white male slaveholders, end quote? According to the Grimke sisters, however, and repeated by countless historians ever since, they first read about Archie and Frank in an article about Lincoln University, the black college located in rural Pennsylvania that the brothers attended after the Civil War. According to Angelina, she and Sarah were, quote, horrified to discover that their brother, Henry Grimke, fathered three boys with his enslaved nurse, Nancy Weston. It was this horror that led them, or so the story went, to meet the brothers, to welcome them into their home in Hyde Park, and to eventually help pay for their education at Lincoln in Archie's tuition at Harvard Law School. But according to all the available historic, historical records, letters, diaries, accounts by family, friends, and acquaintances, Henry Grimke was a particularly brutal and sadistic slaveholder. As a child, he delighted in banging slave boys' heads against door jams, causing one enslaved man named Stephen to suffer permanent brain damage, which eventually meant in the white Grimke begged Sarah and Angelina to bring him north. His head injuries, they argued, meant that he could not fetch a good price on the market. Sarah, Angelina, and two of their other sisters eventually arranged for Stephen to live with them in New Jersey, an act of supposed selflessness that was actually revealing for how unsympathetic the two white women remained about their family's culpability in slavery's inherent brutality. When Stephen arrived in New Jersey and couldn't work, due in part to the permanent brain damage wrought by Henry's violence, the sisters complained that he was, quote, lazy and shiftless, while publicly providing him with a home and a place to say, stay. This is a complex story. It can be a painful story, but we must lean into it and acknowledge it in order to come to some form of racial redemption. Then there is the matter of the Grimke brothers themselves, men who ascended the ranks of the talented tenth, only to reveal in private letters, diaries, and public speeches their own disdain for what they called, quote unquote, the Negro masses, end quote. 
Raised by their mother, Nancy Weston would see themselves as exceptional, to believe that they were, quote, colored Westons, and that the greatest blood of the South flowed through their veins, this is her words, not mine. Both Frank and Archie used the same derogatory language that Sarah and Angelina used when talking about the, quote, unquote, lowly slave, to describe what the brothers saw as the, quote, creeping immorality and looming irrespectability of, quote, the majority of our colored people, end quote. As pastor of the 15th Street Presbyterian Church, for instance, Frank transformed that institution, founded by John Cook in the 1840s, from a welcoming congregation of all classes of colored people into a bastion of postbellum color politics, to use the words of one of his most famous parishioners, the senator, black senator Blanche K. Bruce. Although Grimke transformed 15th Street Presbyterian into a vibrant center of civil rights activism, he also policed its parishioners. He talked about their private lives. He suspended one woman and many women members for supposed impropriety, and he publicly criticized working class and darker skinned black people and residents for their supposed shiftlessness and tendency to, quote, hang bare arms out of, and, out of windows and give the white citizens every reason to distrust us, end quote. Similarly, as consul of the Dominican Republic, Archie often referred to the Dominican peasants as, quote, incapable of self government and, quote, in need of economic intervention from the Yankee businessmen. Here he sounds more like a racist white northerner overseeing the confiscation of freedmen's lands in the 1860s than a black man dedicated to racial equality. It was through Archie's negotiations with the violent government of both the U.S. and the Dominican Republic that U.S. businessmen seized Dominican land for sugar plantations that eventually facilitated America's colonial violence in that country well into the 20th century. So what are we to make of all of these complex stories? How are we to address them? How can we use them to inform and to shape the way that we encounter issues of inequality and racial injustice in our own time? One thing I would argue is to embrace and to look at and stare straight in the face the contradictions that exist in American history. What it mean, would it mean, for instance, to acknowledge that Charlotte Fortin Grimke, seen here, Francis Grimke's wife, first graduate of what becomes Salem um, uh, State University in Salem, Massachusetts, what would it mean to embrace her both as a phenomenally gifted intellectual in her own right, as well as someone who, by the end of her life, distanced herself from the black community from which she came? What would it mean, as well, to lean into the fact that the Grimke sisters, for all that they did for women's rights, for their phenomenally profound statements of anti-slavery sympathies, and for their support for individual black people occasionally within their own private lives. What would it mean to embrace the fact that within that history remains the idea of a white um, dominance and assumed black subjugation? I would argue that this is the beauty of American history. This is the beauty of being a historian, being able to look at the historical record as it stands and examine the historical facts as they exist and not shy away from them but to acknowledge that this is what uh, American history is. I will close with a quote by W.E.B. Du Bois, who argues that nations real and that from this history, and that this history continues to exist. And yet, as human beings, as Americans, as creatures on the planet Earth, it is our job to lean into those complexities. Thank you.
people who must have been around in 1964 when the Civil Rights Act was signed by President Johnson, and maybe even in the 1950s when the Brown versus Board of Education um, decision came down. So what I'd like to ask you as a black historian is, do you think that today in the, um, in the, the wake of uh, this you know, wave of anti-racism after George Floyd was murdered is going to be significantly different than those than the ramifications of those other decisions and, and, and other events that have been significant in, in the history of civil rights and racial equity? Ooh, thank you for the question. Um, I think that um, history is cyclical. I think that um, things that occur in this country regarding race and class and injustice have often occurred before. Um, and that isn't a sign that things have not gotten better, but it's a sign that the forces of history often continue to work themselves out through this cycle and that people are very vigilant about um, ensuring that you know, the mistakes of history are not remade. So um, I would say that I see the current moment, I see the activism for uh, black lives, the, um, you know, uh, struggles for racial justice in the present is sort of part of this very, very, very long history. And we're just, it feels new to us, like all of us, because we're, <laughs> we're in it, right? And we're, everybody thinks that what they're in is new, but it's sort of this long history that has occurred, uh, has occurred before. And that doesn't take away from the significance of the moment. But it does actually, I think there's a power in that because realizing that, um, that uh, historically, um, we're in a moment where this has happened before, but we're also in a moment where um, it can be prevented from happening again, right? So we're in a moment where, uh, you know, in Trotter's time, you know, lynchings were ubiquitous and happened, and people had this idea, well, they just are a feature of American culture, and yet we now live in an era where the um, racial violence continues, but the sort of type of immense, um, um, white mob violence against black people like Emmanuel Rogers um, do not occur on the regular basis that they occurred in 1901, 1902. So I think that is to say a roundabout way of saying that I think we have to look at history as um, something that is constantly um, occurring and that evils in society, injustices in society occur because we kind of don't learn the first time on how to prevent, how to prevent them or how to stop them. And we tend to, um, um, because we're, we're in our own time, we kind of think that our moment is kind of um, singular. I do think what is unique about um, protests of the past, say, 10 years is um, much of what was unique um, of you know, radical movements in the late 60s, which is that you have a lot of younger um, white um, people um, get involved in these, in, these, in these subjects for the first time. Um, that is a good thing, but it's also a dangerous thing because we know that historically what has been happened is that the forces against that movement have been even stronger because it's not just black and brown people protesting, it's young white people, middle class people protesting, and that can tend to uh, lead to, um, from the you know, Black Panther Party to Reconstruction Era to the 1920s, and on, right, that has been the, the sense. But I think that um, we are kind of in the cycles of history, um, and I don't see this as a moment that's gonna cure everything um, at all, but I think we, it, it behooves us to sort of acknowledge that we're kind of in this long trajectory of kind of this struggle that, you know, is, is ongoing. Thank you, another question? Got one over there. Phil Donahue would be proud. <laughs> for many of us who came of age in the 1960s, and I'm, I'm speaking for myself, you know, I feel very discouraged, and I feel such a weight of sadness at where we are in America today. You have the advantage of being with young people, 
<coughs> which I do to some extent. I have grandchildren, and, and they're wonderful. But do you feel that your students are hopeful, or do you feel that they also sense that weight, that sadness? That's a good question. I think it depends on those. I don't think there's a general, I don't think I can generalize with students. I do think that students are overwhelmed. And I think they're, I think um, what younger people say under the age of 24 have gone through in the past, say, 10 years, I have a lot of sympathy for. I mean, I, I can't imagine. I'm somebody, I'm a nerd, naturally love to learn. I can't imagine if I had been in high school with COVID and having to go to school online. That's that's unprecedented, right? Um, the way that we're, we've forced younger people to like and just expect them to behave like it's normal um, for those two or three years when they're online, there's Zoom and who knows whatever other learning ways that people learn might be different than the Zoom thing. So I, I think that students are overwhelmed and I don't think that as a society we have really dealt with the trauma of the past 10 years for younger people and the fact that um, you have police violence, you have um, the political upsets we've had, you have climate change and then you have this pandemic and people have kind of just think that it's over and moved on and yet you, you, were, you came of age in that. Right, so you came of age seeing people just die, right? And seeing, having to go to school online in this, in this weird thing in space. And I see it in my students who are in college, right? I, I joke with them and it's completely understandable that it's like they're three years behind, right? All of them, even kids who are very privileged who go to Tufts, right? And that's not through any fault of theirs, it's through what they've done through, but nobody acknowledges that that's where we are, right? Um, and like when we talk about history, you know, people need to acknowledge and lean into that, it's horrible. Right? Kids who are now in college lost three years. Even those who were very fortunate who had wonderful experiences as you can have in that, they lost, right? And so I hear that a lot from students and see that a lot in sort of just their way of how they're grappling with the world, that all of their understanding of protests and politics comes from that. And I think that as a society, we have to lean into that, right? That that's a real thing, right? Some of the generations had the, you know, the, um, Great Depression, they came of age in that. Some of these younger people came of age in the 60s. This generation has come of age in this moment, and the problem is that we don't really acknowledge that that was a thing, right? We kind of like just think, oh, we get over it. We talk about learning loss. We get sort of mad at students because we think that they're like delayed. But we don't really like think of what has actually gone on for younger people in the past 10 years. Um, so I don't know if that answers your questions. I, I do have, I, I, I'm somebody who tends to not have look like to younger people to like save us all. Um, but I, I do think that um, there is an opportunity within that chaos and within a lot of the damage that the past 10 years has done to students. Again, even students who are doing very, very well, who are on the outskirts, you know, tough students, top in the country, they're going on, they're getting jobs, but they're, you know, that's a weight that they're carrying. And, that, and what was, is phenomenal to me is seeing how it is that we as a country when this generation becomes in systems of power, what is it that what is that going to look like? Um, given that that's the reality again, in a reality that few people acknowledge is very real. Other questions? Um, I have a question. Um, we in the society, even after slavery uh, was abolished. People became political in voting in people to be politicians to make laws to keep people in slavery. As you stated, for vagrancy, people were put in jail because they were, didn't have jobs, they didn't have homes to stay, so they were on the street. So that was used as a law to keep people in slavery. So today, how are we going to get society to understand that as a whole, we must stop putting people in power that continue to make the laws to keep people, minorities, the unprivileged, the disenfranchised, down, downtrodden. 
It's a good question. Uh, I think that, I mean, one of the things uh, Trotter said, you know, in the early 1900s, was really telling people that um, voting and getting people into power is, is because of the way the system works, you have to get them in who are working on the side of the people, but you have to have the communities themselves realize that they are the arbiters of who ends up in that position. And that takes a lot of sort of grassroots galvanizing of people to realize that um, you know, it doesn't have to be this way. If you are dissatisfied with the candidates, right, there are ways that you can work to it. But I would also argue that we are in a moment where people are disenfranchised um, in other areas of the country, not necessarily in where, where we are. It doesn't mean that you know, voting disparities don't exist in Massachusetts, but you know, we are in a, an area, a, an era where the Voting Rights Act has been peeled back and we are not used to living in a world, at least you know, people of my generation who were born in the seventies, of living in a world where that looks like. And so what that looks like is that people don't have a way to elect people to office in many parts of this country who are going to do what they know they need to have done. So I think um, that is a is a is a big barrier, and I think that that, that is a re very real hindrance to people doing that. I would say though, one of the things that is paramount um, is, and this goes back to the 1960s when you had people working um, at freedom schools in the South and educating people, is working on a grassroots level to educate people about how the political process actually works and when it is that their op how, what their options are within the very real system that they exist in, right? And the fact that um, you know there there are ways that you can use civil disobedience, there are ways that you can use organization, but it's going to have to come from working within actual communities themselves and getting that community to have a consciousness about what it is that they can actually do in their situation, while acknowledging that we are in a moment where um, you know in many areas of the country. Um, it is not easy to vote. It is not easy to have access to who is actually on the ballot. I was in, um, doing some um, voting rights work in uh, Texas in was that last year was the primary, so last year. And the fact that they did not have to tell people where the um, voting, where you could vote until like a few days before voting happened and that's considered now legal. Like that, that, that's how people are Living. I think we need to acknowledge that that is, that is a barrier to people. Um, it's not always apathy. It's often, you know, many, many areas of the country where that's just, where are you going to vote on Tuesday? Don't know until Sunday, because no one's going to tell you, right? You work from 9 to whenever 7 o'clock, the polls close at 5, in your community where they're open until 8 in an all-white wealthier community, that's a real thing, right? Um, you're not really given access to actually talk to or question the candidate. Um, these things like WBER, we really would hear people talk in their positions, doesn't often exist. So I think we need to take that in because that's a real hamper to people actually acting politically, even as we encourage communities on the grassroots level to um, recognize um, their, their effects on the political process. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one more question and afterwards you can go in the back and talk with uh, Dr. Manager as well. I had a question about um, the racial blood mixture which has been happening since plantation time and which I think maybe is happening even more and whether that's uh, complication just is the same complication it's been uh, always, or whether there's some hope that that would bring change? It's a good question. So one of the reasons I wrote the Grimsky book um, was because I was very, um, well, number one, my, my own family is very mixed. My sister was married to an Italian-American man, so my nieces are, who are now teenagers, are um, Italian-American and um, African-American. Um, my cousin, who I grew up with, is uh, half Jewish, so his, uh, his mother is Jewish and his father is uh, African American. So I grew up around, you know, recognizing, and in my own family, um, recognizing that um, the complexities of blackness and of race, just in terms of families and what that looks like. 
Um, but I, when I started looking at the Grimsies, I really wrote that book because when my nieces were littler, there was this sense, this was like right after my, my niece was born in 2007, so right before Obama was elected, it was like, oh, okay, everything's gonna be good now because people are, there's more interracial marriage, and right? and there's more black and white people being together. And so um, therefore, like that's gonna be the hope of the future. And talking to my older relatives who were just laughing because they're like, well, black and white people have been having sex and children for since black and white people have existed. So what, how is this possibly going to be the solution, right, to, it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any sense, right? Just looking at our own family, where you know, so and so had a you know white a white lover, and that's how my cousin you know Bobby came to get me, right? You know, th 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 this is his family, and so I was really interested in like in families that then occurred from that organic level. I think that one of the things we have reckoned with, and I, this was sort of in the Trotter book, but in the Good Key book as well, and just something that I've been thinking about as a historian is the fact that you have. Uh, African American people at the end of slavery who were and, and knew that they were the product of rape between white slaveholding men and enslaved black women. And the fact that that was sort of an open secret and yet you, you that generation was not allowed to talk about that very violent way that they came to be. And um, instead it was seen as a source of shame, shame and then kind of you got into the 1890s and it kind of shifted slightly and became a source of pride. And there was like, this whole idea of pathing. So I, 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 I don't think that that is going to save us in any, in any way. Um, I don't think that it's, I don't think that, uh, because I think that, you know, black and white people are inherently mixed in this country, right? Um, and so, um, you know, it, to, to think that somehow mixture is going to, to change things is, is not um, going to happen. And that, you know, in the case of the Dunkey family, um, you could have people who acknowledge that they have these black, nephews, right? So they're not saying that they don't exist. And yet treat those black nephews pretty, you know, brutally and cruelly, right? Because of the racial system in which they live at the time and the fact that, um, you know, not pushing back against the racial system in which they exist. So I, I don't think that uh, <laughs> racial, interracial, again, marriage, um, children, just looking at my own family, the family history and stuff is, is, is a panacea to what ails the United States. Um, it's sort of acknowledging, again, the complex region, reasons why, um, you know, interracial alliances take place or don't take place. You know, so that's a, a, a painful aspect of American, of American um, history and many, many American families. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Granich. Uh, <laughs>